We can mean a lot of things when we talk about data integration. And I just want to uh, first point out that if we're still talking about kind of singular omics data measurements, uh, there are some things which we could think of as data integration, although it's only operating on kind of one of these modes of data. And so there's protein uh, or gene enrichment analysis through uh, David. And I've also put a reference up here for you as well for another um, software. David in particular is pretty specific to subsets of organisms like humans. Um, but this at least gives you kind of a, a place to start from. The premise here is that you can look at those statistics that we would have presumably generated um, from the last section and try to see how those align or don't align with different pathways in the biological system that you're studying. And I know we haven't uh, talked about lipidomics here uh, during this particular summer school, but I did want to mention that if you are getting lipidomics data from EMSL or somewhere else, um, we do have a uh, some of the experts in in the world in lipids and their interpretation, and they've made this nice uh, user interface called Lipid Minion. With the I've got the link and the paper here for you. But when we're talking about data integration, rather than talking about a single data source, I really want to focus on, you know, wh what about when we generate multiple types of data on the same samples? So, for example, earlier uh, this week, you heard about MPLEX technology that can do uh, separation into proteins, metabolites, and lipids. And typically when we generate multiple sets of data on the same set of samples, the goal is really to gain a more holistic understanding of the biological system that we care about. And um, when I talk about integration, I want to be clear that uh, I'm talking about statistical or really empirically driven integration methods. There are other methods that are more mechanistic modeling and causal modeling, uh, some of which you'll hear about tomorrow with uh, Jeremy Zucker and the K-Base team. So oftentimes we get all of this data together and we get all of these spreadsheets and it can just feel like we're kind of drowning in data. So the question is what kind of tools exist out there that maybe can help us parse through that. When we think about this, there there really are two general approaches to data integration as it exists today. So one is we can try to merge data types together, for example, proteomics and metabolomics, and just putting those two data frames that we've been working with in PMART R, um, we can put those together, just binding them. And so you've got data across both data types for each sample. This, of course, would be done after you've done some after you've gone through normalization steps and perhaps you might even need to do some additional scaling. And doing this and then maybe trying to relate that data to the outcome of interest like your treatment groups. So some examples of this would be to fit a statistical learning model um, to determine what kind of protein and metabolite features are predictive of your grouping. Or you could even think about you know, running a PCA with both data or both or multiple data sources. The other approach that people tend to take is uh, rather than trying to model everything according to the outcome and kind of squish the data together is to really take a look at each data source relative to the other and look for relationships between those biomolecules. I do want to point out that as we're doing this, Again, if you're dealing with proteomics data, missing data is a factor to be handled with care. Most existing software out there really um, either forces imputation or is, you know, potentially biasing what you're doing by by treating the data differently when it's missing. So it's important to note cases when that's happening um, and kind of proceed with caution. So in terms of the data merging approach that I discussed, um, we found one of the leading tools uh, 
um, where we're doing, you know, statistical data integration, you don't really, you're not kind of including biological information like pathway um, and reactions and things like that. Uh, comes from a group uh, called, and their product is called Mixomics. So you can see some examples of the type of algorithms they run. Um, so for, um, you may run principal component analysis or what's called a canonical correlation analysis um, and partial least squares, uh, differential or discriminant analysis. So I'm gonna go through a couple of these options for you. The nice thing about this package it is an R package. Um, the nice thing about it is that it's data agnostic. So if you've got sort of any of these mass spec data sets should work with this package. One thing that you might do rather than just running PCA um, on the data kind of squished together, you might think about doing what's called sparse partial least squares discriminant analysis, which is a, a lot of words all at once. But you can basically think of this like you think of PCA, where we're trying to reduce the dimension of our data by putting in all of our biological features in terms of like proteins and metabolites. Um, but rather than trying to reduce the dimension and account for as much variability in the data as possible, the end outcome is that it's really trying to reduce the dimension of the data while maximizing the separation between the groups that you give it. So these could be your treatment effects. Here we're looking at um, the resulting SPLS DA components uh, from comparing just a group of women with gestational diabetes, a uh, lean group and an obese group. And so what comes out of this one is like, similar to a principal component analysis where you get scores for each sample. You can see how well or not well those individual samples separate from one another based on your reduced dimensionality. Uh, this is just kind of a standard uh, discriminant analysis, but the caveat here is with the sparse partial least squares, it's also trying to do some feature selection from you in the back. So unlike PCA, if you put in your proteomics data with you know, 3000 proteins, it, every single protein is gonna get some sort of weight on your components, even if it, it may be something close to zero. Uh, in this case, instead of giving every single biomolecule weight, it will try to pick out the most important features that help drive the separation. So besides this plot where you can see how much separation you're getting between the groups. And we can see, uh, you know, in terms of the first component here, what's really happening is we're separating the lean, um, the lean group from the other two groups. And on component two, we're really kind of separating all three groups from each other. So we're going to loosely kind of interpret component one as what discriminates lean from not lean subjects. And the information that this package will We've run this with both proteomics and in this case, lipidomics data, but you could imagine metabolomics as well. Uh, what you get out of this is your top proteins and lipids that contribute to that first component. You get a similar list for the second component, but here we can see that, um, I know it might be a little bit hard to see, but PSA6, that protein is given the most weight and separating the lean from all of the other groups. And we can, in that way, we can kind of rank these features and how useful they are in discriminating our outcome group from one another. One thing that um, I wanna mention here is, so when we put in protein and lipid data, we typically observe um, lipids on, the scale of like a couple hundred and we observe proteins you know in the thousands of proteins and one thing you'll note is that the, the things that fall out as important are all proteins here um, if you take a look at this detailed list there are a few lipids in there but it's 99 percent proteins that come out of this and this is kind of a key issue that happens when you have this disparity in size when you're using these algorithms and something to keep in mind, which is that when you give it 
something with thousands of biomolecules from one data source and hundreds from another, the algorithm, especially if you have things that are correlated, I mean, it's just going to tend to favor the biomolecule that um, has more things to choose from just by kind of the nature of the algorithm. It doesn't discriminate between data types and try to choose some from each. So you can see if we run this PLSDA separately with just the lipids data, we do actually retain things that are predictive of the groups, but none of these things really, or most of these things don't pop out when we overwhelm the algorithm with all of the, the proteomics data. So, um, Another approach that exists in this mixomics package is called sparse partial least squares and canonical correlation analysis. Essentially, this is just looking for relationships between, say, proteins and lipids or proteins and metabolites, whatever two uh, data sets you feed it. And it's looking for those relationships without respect to group. It's not trying to discriminate sort of treatment groups from one another, but just looking at what things um, have behaviors that coincide with one another. And the output that comes out of this package is a circular plot where we're just getting an idea. Again, this is a sparse implementation. Um, so it's not gonna, it shouldn't return every single biomolecule that you've put into it. And um, along the different components, it's just looking for clusters of, of things and get showing you kind of the direction. So things that are in the same direction along the circle are gonna be, tend to be positively correlated with, an, with one another. If they're on the opposite ends of either the X or Y axis, they're negatively correlated with one another. Um, another type, common type of data integration method that you might see is uh, network integration. So there's been lots and lots of work with transcriptomic and proteomic networks, right? And a lot of these are really specific to sample type or a certain disease, um, very dependent kind of on the organism itself. So I've got here a reference for you that lists out a lot of these potential integration methods since I know, um, I believe it was on Monday that there were folks that were asking about transcriptomics data. There are methods that are agnostic to data types. And one of these is called integromics and it's an R package. And there's also um, a fairly recent publication that I've listed here as well, that has um, a similar type of method. So you've probably seen the output from these ty types of programs before and what comes out of them is something that looks like this, uh, which maybe, uh, you know, you can really stare and zoom in and glean something from this, but there's a lot going on here. It's very difficult to kind of, pick out key aspects of what's happening. But what I will say is the, the integer omics data set or our package that I mentioned earlier, and there are other variants of this too, but explicitly that package is one of them where they actually will do this network integration and try to do it with some penalty where we kind of we get this sparsity or it only, it narrows down your set of biomolecules to something more manageable to look at. Um, some, some things that I wanna mention about these. So most of the current methods that really focus on data integration, they depend on covariance, which is synonymous with correlation. So, that can be helpful, but it has its limitations. So if you remember back to sort of basic stats, correlation is how closely two things are linearly related to one another. So if you look at the plot I have here of some protein plotted against a transcript, you can see that there is 
a nonlinear relationship. It looks like there's a, a quadratic relationship there. And if you calculate a, a correlation to this, the correlation comes back as something like 0.26. So there clearly is some relationship here, but a simple correlation is likely not going to pick this out. And so, you know, this kind of limits a lot of these data integration methods that we've talked about. And further, we know that biological data is super complex and systems are complex. So we could imagine that, suppose we took a look at another protein and made the same plot. You can imagine a scenario like this, where if I look at a second protein and the relationship between protein X and transcript Y might depend on whether or not I actually see protein Z. And a lot of the methods like the networks and the SPLSDA, all of these things, these models, if interact, we call, would call the plot on the right in interaction. If those things exist, you're going to have a lot of trouble finding them because you would have to explicitly um, basically put them into the model and say, I believe this, this interaction exists. And that that's a seemingly impossible task when you're dealing with thousands of biomolecules. So um, I, I want to mention too that a lot of these methods we've talked about things like study design and um, sample size. So a lot of these methods really depend on that assumption of independence between samples. And so if you've got paired samples or time course, all of those types of things, um, it's, it's likely not going to be appropriate for sort of out of the box methods like I've kind of mentioned here. There may be a variant of those methodologies that someone has developed, but you'll have to do some some actual digging. And in terms of replicates, um, I mentioned, let's say we can go back to this network integration with sparsity. Um, in the model formulation, there's actually a parameter that lets the model know how sparse or how, how far should I narrow down my set of biomolecules. That parameter has to be estimated. And in order for that parameter to be estimated, you have to have a good number of replicates. And it's typically, if you're doing something that's relative to sort of a treatment group, typically for thing, these things to be stable, you need somewhere between like eight to 10 replicates per group. Now that group may be, if you're comparing, you know, a treatment to a control, you can certainly run that. If let's say you have five males and five females in each treatment group, you could ignore um, sex and still run this and treat those as, you know, replicates. And these types of statistical learning methods should have some power to overcome those things and find common features. But it's it's important to note here that you know data integration, just because you've measured a lot of things, doesn't mean that these algorithms are going to give you a lot unless you have an appropriately, you know, designed experiment with enough replicates that are going to capture variability. And really if you're doing these types of experiments um, in an ideal world, you would have you would be able to hold some samples out as you're training a model and kind of iteratively do that. It's a very common you know, cross validation is a common thing in statistical learning. So you know, data integration is great. It can provide us insights that a single data source can't, but it certainly has a lot more requirements than just doing kind of the basic univariate statistics that we were talking about before. Um, the last thing that I kind of want to mention is, uh, so I think where the community will really agree is that where we should be heading is moving towards things like using machine learning. And I don't necessarily mean like deep learning neural networks, if, if that's what comes to mind for you. But I'm talking about basic things like statistical learning alg algorithms, like a random forest. So for the example of the data that I've shown you here, we've got um, protein X with protein Z and transcript Y, we would call that an interaction. And I mentioned, you know, straight 
correlative methods or regression methods would, would not be able to find this relationship on its own. A random forest um, will let you have an outcome that is both quantitative or qualitative categorical. But let's suppose that the, you know, the abundance of transcript Y is your outcome and you fit a random forest regression model using all of the proteins as your potential predictor variables. What that might, model might choose to do when it's building trees in the background is say, here are all my samples. I'm first going to break them apart um, based on whether or not protein Z is absent or present as we see there. And then it will break, each side of the tree will break down further based on the abundance to potentially capture the quantitative relationship that we see there. And this is the power of machine learning is it can actually capture some of these interactive effects without them being explicitly, um, explicitly stated by you in the model and what, what the explanatory variables are. Again, you know, uh, machine learning, along with all of these methods, continue to have limitations and missing data. So we talked about imputation earlier. And, you know, should we ignore missing values and just do stats? And we showed you that if you do quantitative and qualitative and treat the missing values as missing rather than imputing them, you actually do really well. If you want to use a machine learning model, uh, on the whole, machine learning models do not allow for missing data. And so you either need to turn your features, like your proteins, into presence, absence, um, and lose some of that abundance information if they're not complete, or you're going to throw out a lot of data um, by removing any proteins that have missingness, or you sort of then resort to imputing missing values. And if you're going to impute missing values, uh, I think we'll go back to the, some of the lessons we talked about previously with Kelly, which is you have to think really hard about this. Do you really want to just impute the data set out of the box or are there proteins that have too much missing information such that you wouldn't actually want to impute them? You know, you'd probably don't want to impute 70% of the values for a protein. And if that comes back as important in a model, you're going to question whether that really is biology or it's just how you filled in the missing data. We often, I mentioned that the sample size requirements can be, and replicates can be quite a bit bigger for these types of methods. And we also discussed earlier that, you know, perhaps you want to grab data sets from multiple experiments, and then we run into issues with batch effects. So there's a lot of work to be done in the research community. Um, I'm certainly happy to point folks towards references, but uh, back on the first page where I was talking about references for the different sort of um, integration methods that are specific to uh, transcriptomics and proteomics, that review contains a lot of good information about just sort of what the state of the art is here. I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, that, you know, I am by no means covering biologically informed sort of data integration and modeling. And that that's what will be covered tomorrow. I think Becky sent an email out for those who are in the breakout sessions. And so you want to make sure you're registered for KBase and have any software requirements downloaded before tomorrow. It should be super insightful and you'll get more of a perspective on how you can actually incorporate information from pathways and things that we know about organisms and how to model those types of things rather than just using the data as, as what it tells you. There's benefit to both methods um, and they're certainly complementary information to one another. So um, with that being said, I'm going to pass this over to uh, Rachel. She's going to tell you a little bit about some visualization, a visualization tool we tend to use. And we'll come back. I've got just like maybe two more slides for you and we can wrap up with questions. Thanks, Lisa. All right, I'm gonna switch over to my slide deck here. Bear with me, everybody. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yes, looks good. Perfect. All right, 
So I'm going to be introducing this package, Trelloscope JS. That's an R package that, as Lisa said, we often use to take a look at our different omics data. And I will sort of start from the top with like a big picture for everybody. So I will start with the idea that data is only meaningful with comparisons. What is big, what is small, what is fast, slow, what is up-regulated or down-regulated if you don't have something to compare to. Even if you're just trying to look at what's in a sample, how do you know what's different and what's the same if you don't have something that you've seen before to know what's different? As scientists, we're constantly using these, these different questions to kind of build meaning, build new hypotheses, methods, and find different candidates for study. So this obviously comes into play when we talk about experimental design. And some of the most famous ones can revolutionize the field. These are some famous examples here. We have the swan flask experiment that completely revolutionized how we understand disease and germs. Uh, we have Mendel's work with his pea plants for alleles and hereditary information. And then in physics, as a kind of out there, non-biological example, we've got, you know, is light a wave or a particle? And the, the double slit experiment did a great job in displaying its wave properties. So comparisons are really, really important to us as scientists. But the question is, how do we pick which ones we should move forward with? Especially since in the current age, technology allows us to collect so much data. And the second you step outside the lab, you have to contend with a huge amount of variables on a huge ranges like age, weight, height, gender, all sorts of things. And what do you risk if you pick the wrong comparison and you miss something that's a terrible oversight, like there's a subset in your data you're not sure about, or maybe there's something useful that you might not immediately think of. As an example that we'll take a look at, we have a data set that's publicly available for life expectancy by country. So you can see the small data set is only a couple of them. And what I did was just pull out kind of the top life expectancies. And you can see there's other different variables being uh, shown here. The country, the continent, the year, the population, the GDP percentage uh, per capita. And this spans about 50 years. So this table by itself is all well and good if you just care about what those maximums kind of look like. But if we were to care about what those trends in different countries look like over time for this data set, things start to get a little bit messy. So this is one of the basic plots available. And as you can tell here, you can't see anything. And it would be very, very tedious and time consuming to go through this data set and isolate every single one of these plots, to try to figure out what kind of trends and comparisons are going on in these different countries. And then the worst case scenario, you might actually miss something that you wouldn't otherwise. So as an example of this, we have a figure here on the right hand side, and this is from a barley data set. And it took 60 years for them to spot this error that we can clearly see with these graphs lined up next to each other. So in this Morris, Morris data set that's circled here, the labels are actually flipped. And that kind of error can be, can you know have an actual impact on your results and what your conclusions are down the line. So, and this is where the trellis, trelliscope idea comes into play. The power of small multiples, the power of being able to show you all this data at once in a way that is easily understood. Because we build this in R, we get consistency across our data sets. We can easily access all our information through the GUI that we're going to build. And we can detect patterns like this and deviations really easily with the human eye. It's much harder to code or to pull out, but it's very easy for us to see. So talking so much about this, we're going to look at our first example here. And this is made with that same table that I was showing you guys earlier. 
with life expectancies by country over time. And so I can interact with this real time. You can kind of see that here. Uh, there's only four different panels on this side. There's a little arrows. So you can push through the data very quick. It makes it really, really effective for observing these different trends. And you can even pick things out almost immediately. I think there's one particular graph here, for example, Cambodia. You can't quite see the year right now, but that time frame where that life expectancy dips drastically, if you ask yourself what was happening around that time, that's the that's the Vietnam War, that's the Cambodia War. And that kind of makes sense to us why that's happening. So to explore some of the other features of this telescope, we have a grid view, which will control how much we can see at once. So this is gonna be good depending on how you make your graphs. We've got labels, which will show us additional information associated with each graph. We've got sorting, which at this current point in time, we're sorting by country alphabetically but you can sort by all these other variables. And probably the most powerful thing in Trelliscope is this filter function, right? Where you can also use these variables as a filter to kind of demonstrate what that looks like. If we're looking at each country, we can see like we would expect in this data set, there is one measurement for each country. If we're looking by continent, we can see we actually have a lot of data from the African continents and then descending as we go. And we can use these different filters to, for example, explore our data in ways we wouldn't normally uh, have easy access to. So if we were interested in, per se, the, the median life expectancy for a country, we would just click on that. And we can see the distribution of median life expectancies pretty easily. It's really nice that you can see all the distributions up front with Trelliscope at a click of a button. And we can say, I'm only interested in these top ones. And you'll notice we'll have a lot less countries to look at. And we see the distribution actually changed in our continents as well. Europe being the prevailing continent for this median measurement that we've selected. So this is probably one of the more powerful features of Trelliscope. And continuing on with all the great things about Trelliscope, it is incredibly easy to use. If you know have if you have a background in ggplot, you need only one extra line of code. For those who don't have a background in ggplot, for a, a brief overview, if you remember that uh, table we had earlier, you basically select a column on your x-axis, select a column for your y-axis. You can select an extra column if you want to color things, make it pretty, and then. For the Trelliscope, you would select a column that you would want to divide your data by into these panels. And that is all you really need to get started and on your way. Uh, there's a couple of links to packages here. Uh, it's well documented. Uh, Ryan Hafen has some great information, has some great slides. That these will be available later. And for those who are participating in the hands-on workshop session, we can show you how to build this kind of thing if you're interested. Uh, that what would be we would be showing you would be working with uh, the strain data that you guys might have gotten familiar with earlier in the week. So we have another telescope here that's looking at the metabolites and these four different strains that we have been talking about earlier. So kind of going through the steps as before, we have this grid where we can see more things going on. We have these labels, we have filters, and we have the sorting mechanism, right? So for our omics data, our metabolites data, these filters can be extremely powerful because we can pull in all the information that we took from PMART R and put it in this display. You can see here, we've got keg, metabolite, inchy key. We've got our p-values for our g-test. We've got a p-value for the t-test. So I'm just gonna do a quick, demonstration here of how that would look. So you'll note we have 200 now. And this is our p-value range that we get from a comparison between our control group and just this first one here. 
And if we were to use the standard 0.05, we narrow it down to only 38 metabolites, right? And let's say we might be interested in any, any metabolite that's changing from the control in all three of these different groups, we could easily do that as well. You can see that the viewer gets a little smaller, but you can easily collapse this so you can get a proper view of your different graphs and metabolites. And that's pretty easy to just add additional filters. And you'll see that we've already gone down from that 38 here. And now we, we set at 29. 29 different metabolites are consistently changing from our control group in this data set. And this could be candidates for further study if we wanted to keep going down this path. I'm also going to note that there are some different cognostics in here that you saw in this data set, right? And these are all based on that, that original, um, the original tables that you will build with a telescope display. And again, in our later session, we'll help you build these if there is interest. So at this point, I think is pretty much the end of that point. We wanted to say that the plots that you were seeing in the displays, as well as those different variables that you could sort by can be completely customized. So to my knowledge, uh, the telescope display supports all kinds of plots, including ggplot, plotly, arbok, cow plots. Uh, you name it, it can be done. Cognostics, as we call them, or those variables that you're sorting and filtering by, just as flexible. If you need to do some long algorithm on these molecules and the data that's associated with that, we can build that and it can be anything you need to be sorted. Not to mention, there are some automated functions within Trelliscope when you use it with uh, the innate ggplot functions that can help suggest additional cognostics to you. So if you recall in my earlier example, I actually sorted by the life expectancy median, but the original table I showed you didn't actually have a median value in there. So it will also help you build your own cognostics that might be of interest. So once again, there are links to the package on GitHub, as well as some tutorials that are extremely helpful resources. And I am ready to take any questions if there happens to be any for this display. So maybe before questions really quick, Rachel, uh, I just have two kind of closing oh, absolutely. slides to just show. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, so Rachel mentioned that these plots are completely customizable. I just wanna show you two examples of that. So um, Kristen Burnham Johnson and Yu Chin Gao and um, Kelly Stratton. Um, I, hopefully I'm not forgetting anyone, but um, those folks worked on nanopots data where you can get sections of proteins or proteomics for sections of tissue. And you know one of the ways that we deployed Trelliscope on that data, you can see we had an optical image of, this is a mouse uterus. Um, and then we're actually plotting like the proteomics data next to it. So you can start to get a feel for that data. And you notice this is a completely different plot from what Rachel has shown, uh, but it's something that we've just coded up in R. And like she mentioned, if you can write a function for a plot, then essentially then it gets applied to every sort of section of your data, in this case, every protein, and launches this nice UI for you. So this is one example. I've got the reference for the paper down there, and it also has a, a link to a telescope display in the paper where you can go play with this if you want. Um, and a second example that I had mentioned before was we had this sleep study. Um, if you're doing cosigner analysis, you get all sorts of parameters like amplitude and how much the phase of your data has shifted. It can be really hard to look through. So, you know, we made these time series plots and we have some of the summary statistics p-values that let 
um, our colleagues search through this data and find the interesting differences between the solid blue line and the dashed red line, which are the trends for the day and night shift. So these are two examples of other types of plots that uh, can easily go into Trelliscope. Um, if you know how to program in R, you know, you know how to write a function for a plot and you know a little bit of tidyverse, it's, it's super easy. And um, we're happy to, I think the tutorials Rachel pointed to will be super useful. And if you're in the afternoon sessions, we're happy to uh, walk you through some of this. So um, I think with that, we've got, we've, we're a little bit early on time, but I think we can go ahead and open it up if there are questions about this session or any of the things that we've discussed today. I think we can go ahead and open this up for Q&A. Can I add one last point before yep. we do that yep. I missed in my notes here, but um, kind of as Lisa was showing, you can kind of having this ability to collaborate, it's really, really easy to share your telescope display because it kind of lives in a folder. You can zip it up and send it to anybody you want and they'll be able to access the same data you are looking at. So it can be incredibly helpful for collaborating and you don't have to get someone else to code as well. That's a great point, Rachel. So maybe uh, Kelly and David, if you will, both want to turn your cameras on and join us, um, see if there are any other questions before we kind of wrap up for the day. Trailscope is useful for just sorting images as well, too, because you can just put that on the back of a plot and sort that way. So that it's we've used it for many different things. Whenever you need to sort a bunch of stuff quickly, it's a wonderful tool to use. And Lisa has been knocking out all the questions in the chat. So I don't think there's anything <laughs> new. Looks like Melanie is typing. So we may have. Have we answered the time delay between the transcriptomics and proteomics question? Well, I answered it probably with nothing satisfactory, which is that okay. I, I don't think there is a good solution at this point. It's definitely an open research question. Are there any cases of data analysis that you often see done wrong that maybe you'd want to warn us about now? I think one of the big ones that we've seen a bit of is when people don't realize that they have correlated data. So when Lisa was talking about like litters of mice or samples from different parts on the same plant, or if you have animals in cages or you've samples that come from the same batch of something, um, it's not always immediately clear. Um, that you have correlated data in those cases. Yeah, and I would add to that that uh, the fact that you have correlated data, uh, if it's modeled appropriately, actually can help you find more significant things because you can account for some of those sources of variability. So I know sometimes folks get scared that the statistician just wants to like, it make things too complicated but actually if you've got some of those like I think I mentioned on Monday if you have you know if you're testing salmon of uh, different ways of smoking it if you were able to take pieces from the same fish and put one piece in the teepee and one piece in the shed that paired part would actually design would actually give you more statistical power than if you didn't pair them and so recognizing those sources of kind of correlatedness as Kelly's talking about actually can be super useful and benefit you in the end. Uh, looks like there's a question that says like David what databases do you suggest for microbes apart from keg? Um, I might actually see if anyone else on the call like Leanne or others have um, better suggestions than I do on that front. 
Yeah, so I see a suggestion of biopsych. So we definitely have used biopsych slash metapsych before. Um, you know, apart from that, I don't have other good suggestions. It tends to be something that I usually lean on the biologist uh, for their sort of expertise in where is this organism well studied if it's well studied at all. So the other thing that comes to mind about um, <laughs> in response to Melody's question about types of analyses is like time course type studies where maybe samples are taken at different time points, but the way that that sampling is done is not necessarily set up well for the sort of traditional time series analysis that someone might have in mind. So they're not taking like samples at the same time points for different conditions or the spacing is not consistent. or it's not technically a time series experiment, even though there are different time points involved. Yeah, I think it sort of cycles back to maybe the last time you might have to hear this message from us, which is you engage a statistician or someone who has familiarity with experimental design early and often. Uh, because the least favorite part of my job is when someone comes to me with data and asks me to answer a question for them and I tell them, well, I can't actually answer that question because your study design doesn't allow it. We have a question on the Discord. Looks like originally trial scope was used for epidemiology data that was modified to suit lab experimental data. Is that true? Are there any shortcomings of the method? Um, Trelloscope was actually um, designed to work with anything really flexibly. So I think it's probably the the publication. Um, I think it's got like a, a cancer application that you, you might have Googled and found. But um, it, the, the premise of Trelloscope was designed to work with any types of any type of data. It's not sort of tailored to anything. And what Ryan intention, intended for it to be was a way to really open up communication between uh, people who are doing data analysis and you know the experts who are collecting the data. So for example, one of the applications that it was originally used for was for some high energy physics data that we, was being collected at. Uh, PNNL and Ryan put that data into a telescope display. They were building machine learning models off of this data. And then when he showed the data to them visually to these scientists, they said, oh, this data is bad, like pointed to a bunch of cases where it's bad, or they didn't realize it because like it's really hard to look at a spreadsheet and know what is going on with my data. But they were training models on like data where 50% of the data was bad until they actually visually looked at it. So, um, you know, I would just say that the, the point of it is to try to give you that foothold to be able to look at your data, what's going on, do you see the things you expect? And, you know, rather than taking a spreadsheet of p-values and trying to make sense of them, you can actually start to get a feel for the dynamics of the data. And perhaps there are things you, intended or thought would come back as significant and they aren't maybe there's something about variability in the data or there's an outlier in your data that wasn't caught all of those things this is meant to help you kind of get that that look and do some of this exploratory data analysis we got another in discord i can read related question in the chat, let's see, as to a potential issue with time courses and whether samples are independent or not. 
how do your points about repeated measure and the example of multiple leaves from the same plant extend to studies using tissue cultured from the same original clone? I imagine this happens for plant studies too, but this is a frequent issue for fungal studies. Uh, what about studies using established cell lines? Do you need to, re to repeat that? I'm just looking at the question in Discord. Got it. So one thing I'll say, uh, Megan, which I'm not, you know, isn't necessarily clear if, you know, if all of your samples in a treatment are coming from the same clone, that's actually not an issue. Um, I mean, you may not be capturing all of the variability if you had independent sort of like things that you were independent um, observations. So really it comes down to like, what kind of inference can you make about the population as a whole? It's the, the problem you run into is when you've got, you know, say, one clone and you get two or three replicates off of that and you apply it you've had a treatment applied and then the same treatment gets applied to another clone and you take two or three samples off of that oh just multiple samples from the same clones oh, okay perfect <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, we do run into this issue with cell lines often, you know, um, especially when we're studying like different, um, yeah, different organisms here too, where it's just not viable to, you've got to take things from the same cell line or you've got to grow things up from the same, same culture. Um, just what you don't want to do is kind of, or I mean, you can do it, but what you don't want to do is mix and match sort of parents of where you're getting these samples within the same treatment and then treat your data as if they all came from the same or they all came from a dip from different uh, cultures. Um, I do see the question about the status quo of network inference and other analyses uh, based on multi-omic data. Um, I don't know that I'm going to give you a satisfactory answer in five minutes on that. So I'm, um, I'm more than happy to continue the conversation um, over email or we can set up a, you know, a time to chat otherwise, but I I don't want to attempt to to rush a discussion that that's just going to cause further confusion. So, Looks like we have a couple more people typing. I don't know, Becky, uh, while we're maybe waiting for the last couple questions to roll in here, um, do you have any announcements for folks before tomorrow? Maybe Becky's not uh, on right now. <laughs> I don't think there's any particular announcements. We do start tomorrow with the open session again at the usual time at 
So tomorrow is going to be about pulling this, all these kinds of data into metabolic models. Um, and in particular, I think for the example we've been talking about all week with uh, modifying an organism, this is ultimately what we want to do. We want to get this data into a metabolic model and see how, whether we'd predicted what would happen, how we would modify metabolism of the fungus, whether that's coming and, and showing up in the data that we gather and in the models um, and how that affects it. So we'll get into metabolic modeling tomorrow. Hope you can all join us again. <clears throat> do you have more questions coming in, Lisa, or do we give people a few minutes break? I think we can give uh, folks a few minutes break. And for those joining us in the breakout sessions, we'll all start in the same Zoom room and kind of break out from there. So thank you all. <laughs>